We're going to be breaking down for you the construction financing process and what you need to know about the ins and outs of how you should structure your financing and also pitfalls to watch out for. We wanted to break down the difference between building and buying on vacant land versus building and buying on a pre-existing property that has a structure on it. What's going on YouTube? It's Rebecca Lynn Matheson, aka the Canadian Cottage Girl, and welcome to the Canadian Real Estate Channel with the Finlay Finance Friday. We have Josh and Aaron here from the Finlay Mortgage Team, and we're going to be breaking down for you the construction financing process and what you need to know about the ins and outs of how you should structure your financing and also pitfalls to watch out for. If you guys like today's video, make sure you like and comment below drop your comments and and feedback we love hearing from you guys and make sure that you subscribe to the canadian real estate channel as well so let's jump right into it guys welcome to the channel thanks so much for having us back always a pleasure absolutely so uh, we're going to be talking about construction financing so let's break that down what exactly is construction financing and what are the specific elements that someone would need to be aware of. Sure. So construction financing is probably one of the most capital intensive things you can do as an invective, as an active investment in real estate. Um, unfortunately, there isn't a whole lot of information on it and there aren't a whole lot of lenders who really specialize in it. So we wanted to do like a high level version of it. We're not going to break down all the exact costs and what it looks like, but we wanted to break down the difference between building and buying on vacant land versus building and buying on a pre-existing property that has a structure on it. Um, first, we're going to talk about essentially the current market as it is at the moment. Uh, it's starting to become very difficult for multifamily real estate investors to reposition properties, um, especially in Ontario where there is uh, rent control and a lot of the laws are focused more on protecting the tenant and not necessarily in as an advantageous situation for the person who owns the property. So some people are looking at purchasing land and building these multifamilies and then being able to actually set market rents initially right off the bat. So instead of having to go through all the capital expenditure to renovate the property, buy privately, uh, turn over tenants, have to deal with the tenant, uh, the tenant boards, all that stuff, they're just saying, I'm going to use my capital, I'm going to build instead of buy. Now, the challenge with this is it does take a little bit more time and you have to have, have decent knowledge of how to construct these buildings, have a great GC, um, and it's a little bit of a more intricate process when it comes to financing. So we thought we'd break that down for everybody today. Absolutely. I think that this is actually a really important topic because before you do a demolition on the property, you should probably know what your plan is from a financial perspective. So yeah, let's let's break down the, the options for, um, you mentioned just completely vacant land and then also you mentioned a house that is already existing that you're going to demolish and then rebuild something new. So let's start with the vacant land and, and what are some of the elements there to consider? For sure. Yeah, so vacant land is going to be your highest capital intensive on the down payment for sure. Vacant land financing really depends on how quickly you're going to utilize that land as well too. If you're buying a piece of land and you're going to sit on that for like five years before you do anything, that creates a riskier situation for a lender because you know if you were to default, now they have to try to flip a piece of land versus if you're going to buy and instantly have um, construction starting on that. You know that that creates a more enticing piece of uh, piece of deal for the lender. So, um, you know, if you're buying a piece of land, you're going to sit on it for a while. Your loan to value is going to be like 40 to 50 percent. You're going to have to have come up with a huge down payment. Um, the rate is going to be a lot higher as well too, and you're going to have a much more difficult time actually getting that financing. Versus if you're buying that piece of land, you got architectural drawings, you got site plan, or your your site plan approved, you got the permits in place, and you're ready to go. Your financing is going to be uh, a little bit more favorable in that sense. Whereas your down payment, you're probably looking like 50 to 65 percent um, and that really depends on 
how you're acquiring that land. If you're just buying the land itself outright first, you're probably closer to 50%, but if you're utilizing some sort of construction financing that has a first draw that can be associated or used to acquire the land, you're gonna be able to get that 65% loan to value, which is definitely a much more attractive if you can save you know, or yeah, save an additional 15% uh, with your capital and put that towards uh, net worth or capital reserves or, or cost to be able to actually do the building. Um, like I said, definitely a much larger down payment um, on the vacant land, but you know, most lenders, when they're assessing a borrower, there's a few things you're gonna take a look at. First off, like what is your financial situation? This is not going to be some flipper who is going in and buying a property and has $20,000 to their name and just utilizes a piece of um, you know, collateral property to get in and out. The lenders are gonna want you to have at least 10 to 15% of your capital costs and savings and net worth, um, ideally liquid net worth. Um, but they're also gonna to wanna to make sure, you know, what is your, you know, like what's your experience? Have you done this before? Are you an experienced uh, developer or builder? Um, and if you're not, who are you bringing on to the project to be able to bring that experience for you? Um, do you have a GC who has been in the game and, and understands the things? Are they local to the area? Are they specialized in the type of building that you've done? If you're only, you know, if you have a developer who's done townhomes and all of a sudden you're building a multi-story uh, apartment or condo building, that experience may not transfer over as there's you know, very large technical difficult or dif uh, differences between the two types of buildings. So making sure your experience and or your general contractor's experience applies specifically to that type of building can be um, you know, a huge advantage as well to getting in terms of like the appraisal done and figuring out what the value is going to be. Um, when you purchase that property, uh, the piece of land, you're going to have an as is value that's going to take a look at, you know, what is that land currently worth? And then you're going to figure out, you know, what is your project going to be worth as it's all completed. Um, there's a multiple different types of approaches that they're going to take a look into there, maybe some comparative approaches, but a lot of it's going to be done based off of a cost approach. What is the cost of the, the goods and the materials going into there to be able to come up with the final valuation approach. Um, now when we're taking a look at loan size, we're usually getting somewhere close to 75 to 80 percent of that as completed value. I mean that all depends on the size of the project and what the project is, but you know, 75% you know, is a pretty reasonable amount to be uh, getting in that loan size. Now, when we take a look at the usage of that 75, 80% of that um, as completed value, um, like I said, that first draw, 65% of that, if that lender has that, is allocated to the acquisition of the property, which means you're coming up with 35% down. Now, some lenders have an unlimited draw structure where, uh, you know, as long as you're making forward progress, they allow you to take as many draws as you want. Some lenders, depending on the type of construction, you know, may have have a more regimented draw structure just to ensure that you aren't just taking out money and, and you know potentially essentially giving yourself a salary and kind of putting that money to no use. Depending on the lender, you know, we do have some that allow for the unlimited draws, again, just as long as there is forward progress. You know, again, they're gonna to wanna to take a look at 10 to 15% in capital reserves of that budget, um, of that renovation construction budget and making sure that you do have the, uh, the reserves in place. Some things to consider too when you're moving forward is um, obviously with that, you know, what is that increase in land value as you get to SPA? There is a significant increase in value of your project once you hit that SPA or that site plan approval. At the point where the project's approved, you have the permits in place, you got the approval from the city, you're ready to go. There's a huge increase in value there and there's a couple things you could do with this. When you get to SPA, you can either continue that project yourself and take the full project to fruition and realize the gains based off of you know either owning the development or selling off the development, but you could also look at potentially flipping this project at SPA as well too. Okay. Um, now this requires a pretty extensive network you know, due to the cost of carrying construction financing, especially if you're in private financing and you're sitting on 10 to 12%, you know, sitting on SPA and just waiting for a buyer, you know, can be quite costly. But if you have a network of developers or investors who are ready to go on SPA land, you know, there's a pretty significant increase in value. Like I said, you could be looking at, you know, 10X your, your land value at that time of SPA. If you had the network in position, ready to go and flip, quickly flip that land off to someone, you, know, you could realize some pretty quick gains there and have some pretty decent um, uh, profit from that. Um, now, like I said, the other, offer, the other option is you take that land to development and, and, you know, fruition and realize the full project in and of itself, either sell it or, or own the project from there. 
So site plan approval, so SPA, how long does that process typically take? And it sounds like it's quite extensive, so we're looking at potential utility hookups, we're looking at all of the different elements of like um, getting engineering, I'm guessing, to ensure that you have um, the full approval for your plans, and then you're saying at that point you can choose to move forward with the project, or you can choose to take a step back and flip that project over to somebody else for a return. So um, from, from that perspective, how long does that typically take to actually go through that site plan approval? Depends on the city, really. Yeah, like, it's a great question. Yeah. Um, depends on how busy they are. You know, you, you could be six to eight months sometimes. Um, depends on who you are, I'm sure, too, what kind of you know clout you bring as a developer. So, you know, it, it's tough to say, but be prepared for a significant amount of time due to holdups, due to questions, due to things that could come up throughout the process. It's important to note that different projects have different site plan approval requirements. So when you're talking about wanting to build uh, a duplex or a single family home, it, the reports that you need and the uh, requirements that you need from the city are much less and probably uh, you can get them done a lot quicker than if you were to have a, a large development. Right. When you get into larger developments, you have sound uh, studies, you have shadow studies, you have a different phase one, phase twos, possibly even phase threes for remediation. Um, there's It goes to the board. You have an option for the, the community to come and talk about you know, if they want your dealer or if they want you to build your project or not. Um, the site plan approval process is very different depending on the size of project. So when it comes to a single family home, probably really straightforward, doesn't take a whole lot of time, does cost some money to be able to do it, especially if you need to service the site with uh, utilities. Um, if you have a larger project, extremely expensive, you need to be well capitalized to do it. Um, but obviously the lift in both those projects are quite different. So it really just depends on the type of project you're looking to have. Right, so from that buyer's perspective, definitely if, if you're maybe a, a small time investor, you have a few projects and then you find this piece of vacant land and understand there are a ton of things that go into it and um, to just buy a piece of land the it sounds like it's about six to eight months that you can expect just in the planning phase like this is just strictly planning getting approval from the city actually making sure that you have all of the the drawings and everything done up for the project so this is not a short timeline like you need to ensure that you have the capital available to actually see this to fruition uh, 100%. I think that's why we like to segregate uh, different, like this in different steps. So if you bought vacant land, serviced it, got it to SPA, that's one step. Yeah. That is shovel ready. Another guy can come in, put a shovel on the ground. I have money to be able to do the project. And I have construction financing. You move ahead. Now, if you wanted to, obviously, as Aaron was saying, you wanted to bring it to that SPA approval, the value increases. You could do whatever you'd like there, but you do need additional capital to be able to bring it to fruition. And sometimes, you know the expertise and the people who bring who have who are really good at this part aren't necessarily really good at this part but you know you can make it it's different types of investments and different types of strategies and actually these two types of investment strategies are actually really um they're really underrepresented there aren't a whole lot of people who understand how to do this properly and a lot of it has to do with bureaucracy with the city going through the red tape you know if you're somebody who likes to physically you know have an active investment this is active but this is a whole different type of active this is this is dealing with consultants and, and bringing everything on maybe the more, um, this is more of like, has more of an administrative component to it. So, um, you know, a lot of the developers I know personally, you know, have made a ton of, a ton of money doing this. It's just, it's a very different skill set than what most people would think of when they think of construction financing. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Just in terms of, again, it comes back to your why and what you're looking to uh, actually build in your investing portfolio. It sounds like you can get good at any of these strategies. It's just a matter of learning all of the nuances. And this is one that I, I really don't run into a lot of investors that are in this space that often because it is more nuanced and there are more challenges. And um, it, But if you can get really good at scaling that or really good at actually understanding what the city is trying to accomplish and and you're fixing the city's problems, then you, you can cut through a lot of that red tape. So I can definitely appreciate that perspective. So uh, once you get into everything's approved, then you go through the, the full actual scope of the project. What's next after that? Construction financing, um, and and I think Aaron touched on it a little bit, but most lenders will do 75 to 80 percent of the as complete value, essentially meaning. Um, 
the loan amount that they'll give you is up to that percentage of whatever the as complete value on the appraisal is. Um, Usually it's in construction draws, so the 10 to 15% of liquid capital that we would recommend you have is for you to get to the next stage. So we, we want you to be able to do as much as you can, get a progress report, give you more money for your draw, do as much as you can. And, and while you're through that, you know, your monthly payments are being deducted from the advance of the loan. Um, the fees are being deducted from the advance of the loan. It's a handful of things that are deducted as you go through the process, as well as keep in mind a 10% hold back on all construction draw mortgages, meaning 10% of all the funds you're gonna be getting are held back. So every time you have a draw, that's being held at the lawyer's office. And that's held specifically because if there's any uh, liens put on the property for people who had work that had to get done but didn't get paid out, that is to have make sure that they get paid out. Um, so uh, making sure that, that that process is is dialed in and your numbers are dialed in is really important. Um, but that construction draw financing, uh, it really depends on how long your project's gonna take to do. Awesome, definitely appreciate that. Um, is there anything else that, that we should really consider when um, trying to look at vacant land or, or go through that financing process? Are you in the city planning? So obviously rezoning is an extremely difficult thing to do. Um, so understanding what the city has plans for now and in the future, a lot of people will speculate on land purchases. Some people will purchase land just in the hopes that one day that the city plan will incorporate that. You know, we're seeing that with Kitchener Waterloo right now. Uh, large developers have purchased anything on the outside outskirts and you know, in the last 10, 15 years they've been moving out. Now you can't annex anymore, but there is a certain amount of land that's still available to develop. And we're starting to see that kind of maxed out at the moment, um, but, but yeah. Okay, definitely appreciate that. Now let's move into when we actually have an existing structure on the property, uh, but we want to do a development project. So what does that look like for construction, financing, all of those elements? So this could be a little bit more tricky. So I'm just gonna put it in very simple terms in regards to say somebody owns a home already or just bought a home and that home has obviously value but you want to say build, like do an addition or make it bigger, somehow make it maybe a turn a triplex into a sixplex. The value of that property is gonna be based off of the actual value of the land itself. So unfortunately, say you buy a property and it's worth a million dollars a lot of the value of that property is based off the building that's on the property at the moment because it's the highest and best use case of that property right now. Now when you're trying to get construction financing, they're going to be able to give you a loan based off of like 65% of the, the land value. And they can factor in a portion of the pre-existing property, especially if, it are, if you're going to be using the same foundation or part of the, you know, the, the walls that are already framed. We can have a portion of that as complete based off your project. But unfortunately, the gap between that 65% on the land value and how much you actually have in value of the property is much less than probably the 80% mortgage you have. So covering that gap is something you're gonna to need to consider. So I have a client who is doing a project right now and uh, you know, when, when you take down part of the walls or you take down a portion of the property uh, or of the project, unfortunately, if you put capital into that project and you're no, not further ahead percentage-wise when you're complete you're not able to get that extra um, draw right away. So having that liquid capital available to be able to move your project along is gonna be really important with this type of financing, specifically because you're gonna to need to bring it a little bit further ahead than you normally would without having a, uh, a property on the actual uh, land. Absolutely, definitely appreciate that, yeah. And I think that this is another really important thing to highlight is that that's probably why we don't see as many people in this space is because it requires so much capital. But if you have the capital, then there's definitely op like opportunity in this space. But um, I, I'd like to break that down a little bit further with the existing structure because I, I think that that's something that people consider. Oh, th this property is distressed; it's a teardown. Like, okay, let's take a look at what the actual numbers look like for financing that. I think that that's actually a really important consideration um, when tearing something down. So what are some of the pitfalls that somebody could run into? You mentioned a really important one there of like running out of money and getting to a certain percentage of completion in the project. What are some other things that you might see? 
I think when you look at a teardown, for example, like you have to take a look at the entire project in its entirety. So like if it's a teardown, what does the actual foundation look like? What part of the house do you actually plan on using? Um, the majority of the time, most people don't use any part of the house if it's a teardown. They'll start from scratch. Um, most of the time if you're purchasing a property like that you're going to try to only really pay what the land value is right. because if you pay a little bit more than that then you got to cover the difference because the lender who's that was only going to give you a loan based off the actual value of the land mm -hmm. and especially if you're just demolishing the house now for people who have a, a decent structure who want to maybe add on to that structure we can use a portion of that structure so say the, the foundation is done and three four four walls are done and three units are done you want to add another three units on the back you can say maybe that's 30 percent of the construction is actually complete because what's going to happen is your your builder is going to give you a total budget to complete and that budget is going to include the entire project right. so if 30 percent of it's complete already then you're already that far, much further ahead so when you go get your next draw you're going to take it into consideration what's already complete um, which, which is great so if you can use a portion of the property you currently have it's great to be able to do that but if you demolish a part of that property then essentially the liquid cash you have is going to need to make up the percentage of complete to be able to get to the next draw which can be challenging depending on if you demolish more than you thought you needed to or whatever that looks like. Uh, most lenders are decently flexible in regards to helping uh, helping borrowers get to the next draw, but it is a very capital intensive process. And if you find yourself stuck with uh, an issue that you maybe you didn't necessarily consider, um, or if you have a GC that isn't dialed in on their total cost, uh, it can be extremely uh, difficult to move forward with your project. So right. this isn't something that I recommend somebody do for their first deal or even their second deal, um, or at least have a mentor who's gonna guide you on how to do this properly. Make sure your power team is there to be able to advise you on how to do this, um, and your general contractor has to be dialed in unless you understand what you're doing by yourself. Got it. Now, you mentioned draws. So how much do you typically get access to at the beginning? And then what percentage of completion are you able to go back in for your next draw? I'm sure this varies. So um, what what does that typically look like, though? Because that's not, not average for any sort of lending. Most of the time, you just get the full amount that you're being lent, um, and you're able to go about your project. Whereas in, in this sort of construction mode, you're getting like portions of the lending over time. So what does that actually break down to? Correct, yeah, so most like large conventional banks have like four or five draws depending on how they want to structure it. And that's what Aaron was saying as they're, it's very regimented. Whereas some of the private lenders out there in the space, they will have an unlimited draw structure. Right. So some guys would much rather be able to pay their guys every every four weeks and there are guys out there who will just go get an appraisal done or a progress report done every four weeks and that'll say look I'm this much further ahead issue me this much more money based off the percentage of complete of the cost of the project so you know it really depends on how you want to structure it um, if you're if your builder like has tear-in warranty, there's a handful of things that are gonna allow you to either get conventional financing or private financing and your choice between conventional and private financing is going to dictate your draw structure as well. Got it. So basically you qualify for the entire amount of the lending and then you only get access to it at certain points. So you kind of unlock each stage through the completion of the project. That's correct. And then the expenses such as the carrying cost alone is deducted from the draw advance. So that capital that you have is there to make up the difference of what you would have paid as your additional expenses plus if any additional costs come up. Got it. Okay, is there anything else that uh, we should know about these sorts of financing options? I think um, another term that you might have like, heard for buying these like, pre-existing structures is the infill type financing. Mm -hmm. um, I think infill is going to play a big part moving forward just due to the red tape that you have to pass through for doing a complete development from vacant land. If you're able to purchase property that's already zoned and maybe there's a triplex on it, but it's you know medium density type product and you can do eight to 10 units, you, know, you don't have to go through a lot of the red tape that you had to go through to take a vacant piece of land, rezone, go through the permit process and get there. Um, so there, when you do the infill, there are some of the steps that have already been completed for you. You know, we're seeing this in Ottawa where they're changing a lot of the the zoning and the densities from you know one to four unit properties to medium which is like eight to twelve units um, so which means you know we're getting people who are going there buying up these duplexes sitting on them holding and then waiting until they have the capital from other projects tearing them down building a small eight plex twelve plex and you know resetting the rents and then either owning that or, or selling it off and i think 
given the current environment of you know lack of rentals and lack of properties available like the infill and having that available and being able to complete those projects um, i think there's a lot to be said and a lot of opportunity there you know it's a great way to be able to go in and set the rents from day one you know you're you kind of have a little bit of higher costs initially, but when you can go in and you can get eight units and you can set brand new rents for all eight of those units and you walk away with this tremendously cash land property, you know, there's a lot to be said there, um, even though there is high intensive capital uh, required. But I think infill, you know, there's, there's quite a few people out there that are doing infill construction, maybe without actually realizing what they're doing. Right. Um, but it is a great way to be able to, you know, buy a, a distressed piece of property turn it over and it's it's good to go you know you in most circumstances when you're buying infill the land's already been approved in terms of environmental issues um you would have had to have some sort of phase one when it was initially purchased so unless there's been any drastic changes in that area throughout the time of purchase till now you know you safe to assume the land is, is clean and you're not going to have to come up with those costs because you know phase one's 2500 bucks phase two could be 50 grand phase three if you have to remediate it you know could be enough that you want to walk away from the entire project so um you know there are some things that are already done when you're buying these um pre-existing properties in terms of buildings already constructed um but so you know a few steps are already completed and it can be a little bit quicker way to get in and out but still very capital intensive and there still can be some uh, some hurdles to overcome. So specifically, you mentioned infill. So what actually allows for a project to be classified as infill or what, it, what is that definition? Is it just that some of the, the project or the zoning has been changed accordingly? What is the infill term uh, meaning? Yeah, Define infill as like pre-existing. Um, I mean, you could still do zoning changes through uh, infill, but Infill, I guess, in my eyes, is something that's already kind of pre-existing and there might be already a predetermined use. And then, like I said, you can apply to change that usage. But, um, you know, zoning changes happen just periodically throughout the city and determining, like I said, in Ottawa, they're, the city is already going through and just changing those for them. So, um, you know, it might have been when it was previously built, zoned only for a duplex. But since then, due to, uh, you know, unit requirements and, and density needed, the city's changed it and how that piece of land could be zoned for up to eight or some sort of like medium residential density. So um, I just kind of look at it as anything that's pre-existing. Yeah, you're starting to see that in a lot of large metropolitan areas, Ottawa, Toronto, you see it happening sometimes. Um, and as, as Aaron said, I think that as we have a supply issue, I think that the only way for the government to be able to allow for the stopping the rapid increase in, in value of these properties, which I'm not saying is a bad thing, but they're gonna have to cut the red tape. They're gonna have to allow for density. They're gonna have to allow for builders to start building these multifamily properties. Um, and I think that is where a lot of, uh, a lot of investors are gonna be moving to in the short to medium term. Yeah, I think that this is, uh, I mean, we could do a whole another video about um, the actual breakdown here, but I think that this is a really important point just about um, there being a lack of inventory on market, both in terms of buying houses as well as renting. So we're going to need more units. Like that is just something that is, is going to be a problem going forward. And especially as we see immigration starting to pick up across a lot of different cities in Ontario, and in Canada in general, we need more inventory. So in order to make up for that, that actually just has to be developed. And, and we are going to have to turn to those investors, turn to those developers. And absolutely, I think cutting through the red tape is, is going to be a, a really important element to that. Completely agree. I think, uh, I think you're going to start seeing the emergence of this as, as a really predominant investment strategy moving forward. It's not something that is for the faint of heart. You do need capital. You do need experience. But you can start seeing a lot more guys being vocal about doing this. Um, we have quite a few people who maybe just aren't as vocal on social media doing it. And it, it's a great way to be able to have cash flowing assets, um, unlimited equity takeouts for multifamily property. It's a great way to be able to force appreciated properties. You know, uh, And a lot of people have direct control over exactly what their project is going to give them in regards to ROI and being able to scale what they're doing. Absolutely. Awesome, guys. Well, thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Finlay Finance 
Friday on the Canadian Real Estate Channel. Again, my name is Rebecca Lynn Matheson, aka the Canadian Cottage Girl, and make sure that if you enjoyed today's video, that you smash that like button down below, uh, hit up the comment section, and also subscribe to the Canadian Real Estate Channel. We are pumping out a ton of real estate investor-friendly content with multiple different investing strategies. And if you want more financing content, make sure you flip it over to the Finlay Mortgage Team channel where you can actually gain a ton of knowledge on how to finance your deal and also just give them a call if you need a mortgage agent. Perfect. Yeah, thanks so much for having us on, guys. We really appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you on the next one. Peace.